Hey, welcome to Prey Lakes Church. I'm Cody, I'm one of the pastors here. And now that we're officially on the other side of Thanksgiving, I can say it, uh, Merry Christmas is seriously uh, one of our, uh, my family's favorite uh, times of the year. Uh, our Christmas tree goes up uh, immediately after Halloween every year. Uh, but for your sake, I withheld uh, saying Merry Christmas until now that we're on the other side of Thanksgiving. So Merry Christmas. We're kicking off our Advent series here uh, today, which is super exciting. Uh, but before anything else, uh, we need you to hear this about Prairie Lakes Church. Uh, we're a no matter church. And what that means is no matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, or even what's been done to you, uh, we need you to know that God loves you, uh, that we love you, and PLC is a place uh, where you can look for Him. Uh, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to clean yourself up to be here. We're just really glad that you're here. And maybe you're brand new today, or maybe you've been around for a long time and you're just new uh, to being connected. You haven't become known. Uh, you haven't met others. You haven't taken next steps. If you're in that spot, I encourage you to take that step to become known here today, because what we know is this, uh, connected people are grown people. When you take that step to become known, when you ask questions, when you take next steps, uh, God uses that in significant ways. So if you take that step here today, I'm gonna to get you an Amazon gift card uh, just as a thank you for taking that step. And all you need to do, it takes about 30 seconds, is text NEW uh, to 99581. You'll get an automated text to a link to our welcome card. It takes about 30 seconds to fill that out. Uh, I'm gonna receive that, I'll be on the other end, and I'm not gonna spam you with texts or emails. I'm gonna reach out to see how I can be praying for you and get you an Amazon gift card here today. So all you need to do again is text NEW to 99581. And the next step that we talk about every week is giving generously. And when you give to Prairie Lakes Church, uh, you partner with us in changing lives. Uh, you uh, join us on our mission here to cover the state of Iowa with no matter churches. So if you wanna join me uh, in giving, uh, you can do that right now by going to prairielakes.org forward slash give, and you can select your campus from that page. We are going to continue in today's service. So see you back in a little bit.
open wide our heavenly home make safe the way that leads on high and close the path of me I know we've probably already said it to you today, my friends, but let me say it again. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, okay? Um, hey, every time I hear that phrase, Merry Christmas, every time I hear it, uh, it reminds me of a scene from uh, one of my favorite Christmas movies um, where that phrase, Merry Christmas, just kind of rings out. And uh, the movie is the 2005 remake of uh, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, uh, best Merry Christmas scene ever, I, in my opinion, humble opinion. And uh, so the scene is like Peter, Lucy, and Susan have gone through the wardrobe and they're in Narnia and the White Witch is chasing them and they're hiding under this like snowy bow and you can hear the crunching of the footsteps above them. And, you know, little Lucy has the courage to kind of peek herself out. And she's gonna check it out. Um, actually, you know what? Let's just let's just watch it. So, Merry Christmas, okay? Merry Christmas to all of you. And like Father Christmas, uh, we thought at Prairie Lakes, we thought that as we launch into this holiday season, um, we'd like to give you some tools, uh, some tools to navigate just the ups and the downs, the ups and the downs uh, that oftentimes come our way this year. Um, so here's what we're doing. We're starting a series called, I Just Wish That. I Just Wish um, so, uh, take a, take a walk down, uh, memory lane with me just, just for a second. We love to do that at Christmas, right? Take, uh, so, so, so think back, think back, um, all the way back to when you were a kid, uh, at this time of year, um, maybe, probably you, uh, you had a Christmas wish list, right? Um, and uh, we probably should pause and just qualify for the Gen Zers. Uh, when we say wish list, we're not talking about Amazon. Um, for those of us who are a little older, like we, we had an actual list that we actually wrote down and, and it was populated by things we saw in between Saturday morning cartoons and commercials or we, there's a, these catalogs anyway. Um, but, but think back, okay? Think back. What was on, what was the top thing on your Christmas wish list as a kid? You got it? Um, this is, by the way, this is such a great generational question. It really is. Um, you could probably guess someone's age by hearing what was on their list. In fact, um, let's test that theory right now, okay? Uh, see if you can tell how old I am um, by what was uh, on the top of my list as a kid. Uh, he here it is. 
Oh man, still gets my heart racing. Okay, now just in case you don't know what you're looking at, let me let me let me let me tell you. Uh, this is what is known as a Power Wheels uh, Bigfoot four x four monster truck ride on toy. All right, um, and what was so cool about this? What was so cool about this thing um, was that it was powered electrically. Like you didn't have to pedal it like a peasant, you know? Like you just turned it on and you push down the gas pedal, right? Um, commercials were awesome, you know, they were going over mountains, right? Um, I remember as a kid just wanting it just so, so badly. But of course, um, you know, my parents didn't love me enough. <laughs> and, you know, I had to just pretend that I liked all of the other awesome gifts that they gave me every Christmas, right? Um, you, uh, you want to know where I, I got this picture, by the way? Uh, this, it, I ripped this from an eBay listing, okay? Like, you could buy this thing right now for a cool $500. $500, dollars, <laughs> which I think is probably, like, how much it cost, like, back in 1986, too. Adjust that for inflation, right? But, okay, so that was mine. Now, I, I bet you had a gift like that. I bet you do. Um, something you really, really wanted, something you really, really wanted, but probably, you probably just weren't going to get it, you know? Um, fast forward now with me down memory lane back to 2023, um, the current adult version of you and me. Uh, I think it, I think it is fair to say that you and I, we still have wish lists. We do. Um, Maybe not written out, but we've got them. Uh, and, and I guess what I mean by that is, is Christmas is still a time where the longings of our heart, what we wish for, what we hope for, those things at Christmas, they tend to rise to the surface. Whether we like it or not, they do. Um, uh, and there's good reason, really. There's good reason for that. Um, I think the reason we are that way has everything to do with what Christmas actually is and how Christmas even began in the first place. Um, unlike a lot of other holidays, which are <laughs> um, kind of human-made or Hallmark-inspired, um, and, and, and despite all the commercialism that's still a part of it, Christmas is not a thing for any of those reasons. Christmas is a thing because the God of the universe, <laughs> our, our creator, the guy that breathed breath of life into you and me, he, he longed to be with us and he longs for us to be with him. And so at Christmas, he sent his son, Jesus, to be our promised Messiah, to, to save us from the sin that was separating us from him. And so what I'm trying to say is like, I think our longings for peace or our longings for joy or our wishes for a a great family or simplicity or, or whatever, like all of those Christmas time sentiments and emotions and feelings and wishes, all of them find their origin and their fulfillment in God with us, in Jesus, um, the baby born in the manger, okay? And yet, and yet, um, just like that way too expensive toy <laughs> on our childhood wish list, all of those things that our heart wishes for at Christmas time sometimes kind of just face plant on the floor um, of real life, uh, life in the real world, um, which among other things is a world made up of, of brokenness and, and, and broken people. Um, as much as we'd like Christmas to be a time where we can just drown out all the bad stuff and or somehow rewrite our story into like a Hallmark movie ending, um, oftentimes it's, it's exactly the opposite at Christmas, right? I mean, Christmas, for a lot of us, Christmas can be a time where we're reminded uh, just how far the life we're living is from the life we wish for. But I believe this, friends. Uh, it is that gap, okay, between what we wish and what actually is. It's that gap 
that's often highlighted at Christmas time, but it's that gap where Jesus wants to meet us. Right there. Um, at Christmas time, Jesus wants to meet us in the gap between what we just wish and what just is. So this is really the idea behind the whole series, um, what we're going to be talking about for the next four weeks. And uh, so here's how it's going to play out for us, okay? In this series, this week we're going to talk about family. I just wish it was easier. <laughs> next week we're going to talk about grief. Man, I just, I wish they were still here. Um, we're dealing with that at Christmas time. Um, the third week we'll talk about just our resources, you know, our time and our money. We just wish we had more, you know. Um, and then right before Christmas Eve, we'll talk about mental health. Um, and just, just this wish that some of us, we just, we just, we just wish we felt better. We felt more normal, whatever that is, you know? So, and, and, and by the way, as we walk through all of this, we'll just be walking through the Christmas story, um, because God has something to say in it, um, for all of those things. All right. Okay. So let's jump into it this weekend. I just wish that it was easier. I just wish that it was easier. Let's talk, uh, <laughs> let's talk about our families. All right. Um, so it's the Sunday after Thanksgiving, right? Uh, we could call this our, our post Thanksgiving show, or we could call it our pre Christmas show. Um, but either way, uh, this weekend is the perfect weekend to talk about our families because either you just spent a day or two together, um, or you are about to here in just a few short weeks. Now I want to go on record saying this. Okay. Before I say anything else about family, um, I have the perfect family. Okay, uh, all of them, including me, maybe especially me, uh, perfectly wonderful people to be around, absolute joy to be around all the time. Um, all of them, including me, including me, uh, me especially, just a big gift to being in my presence. Don't ask them, take my word for it. Um, <laughs> kidding aside, okay, kidding aside, um, my, my family and, and my family extended uh, are pretty great. <laughs> they are, I mean, no family's perfect, of course, including ours, but I'm just, I feel pretty fortunate. All of us follow Jesus, um, which is so rare. Um, we don't have these weird political or social arguments. Uh, we don't drink too much. Our kids get along with each other. Um, and so while, while we certainly have our histories and dynamics and quirks and whatever, um, we've got pretty good. We do. Uh, we don't dread being around each other. Um, I don't think. And if any one of them does, they can keep their opinion to themselves. Am I right? <laughs> okay, so that's mine. Now, maybe your family's a little bit more like mine. You know, it's not perfect, but it's generally pretty good. You kind of look forward to being around them at the holidays. But if that's you, okay, if that's you, uh, count yourself lucky because you and me, um, we are in the minority. In fact, I think we're in the vast minority. Um Many, if, if not most of us, have some pretty, pretty difficult dynamics uh, around the family Thanksgiving or the family Christmas table. We've got some difficult dynamics, or, or we do, and because of those, we've got some people missing from around that table now um, because they haven't come back since fill-in-the-blank happened. And, uh, and, and so we, we kind of brace for dealing with all of that at this time of year because we're going to be in proximity of each other. Um, and so for some of us, if we wrote our wish list out at Christmas, on the very top of that list would be, I just wish it was easier. You know, like I just wish it was easier. Um, and I think, I think that same wish was on the very top of Mary and Joseph's list as well. Um, so turn with me to Matthew 1, 18 through 20. Um, this is the Christmas story, part of it. Matthew 1, 18 through 20. Matthew is very first book in the New Testament. If you're reading in your own Bible, um, we'll have some of the verses on the screen here as well. Um, and just let me say this, okay? It's important to be in the Bible. It is. It's especially important at this time of year. I mean, we need to hear God's voice all the time, every day, you know? It's especially important at this time of year. Okay, so let's make sure we're, we're in it. Matthew 1, 18 through 20. Uh, here's what it says. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, 
She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. <laughs> because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is the story of Jesus' birth, T minus nine months. Uh, his mom, Mary, is engaged to a young man, uh, a man named Joseph. And, and Joseph and Mary were both God followers. And they came from families who followed him. And so part of that was just they wanted to do it right. They wanted to do engagement right, um, which meant waiting for their marriage before they consummated. But Mary is found to be pregnant, right? Which kind of scandalous. I mean, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure it happened then, like it happens sometimes now. Um, but it happened then in the context of a community who defined purity according to how God defined it. Just these kinds of relations should happen in the context of marriage. So Mary's pregnant. They're not married. Scandalous. And not in a good way, okay? Um, and of course, you know, as you can imagine, everybody be looking at Joseph, but it gets even a little bit more salacious because the baby isn't his. So now we're not just at the scandalous level. I mean, we're, we're, at, we're at shame. Um, you're, you're pregnant, Mary, and it's not even your future husband's, and how did this happen again? Now, we know the story. Um, we know the how and the why of this. You know, it was God's spirit so that Jesus was begotten, not made, which is fancy language for the eternal Son of God not being created by human beings, but becoming a human nonetheless. But we know that <laughs> after like centuries of theological reflection and development, you know, the doctrine of the virgin birth is just that to us. It's doctrine. Um, but the story isn't about a doctrine. and It's the story about two real people starting a real life together, now starting a family together, totally unplanned, in a community that I'm sure met their explanation with not only doubt, but probably even rejection. And we know that Joseph doesn't want to subject her to public disgrace, but... We should misread the story here. They still absolutely experience that disgrace. I'm sure of it. Because there's no way anyone believed them. Mary was a promiscuous pregnant teen. Joseph was a fool. Jesus was illegitimate. I mean, I'm sure it was as simple as that in the minds of most. Jesus was the product of a broken family. And I'm sure he and his folks have had, you know, if you talk to them today, they'd have memories of being treated that way. In fact, I think you could even say that Jesus came from a long line of broken families. We're in Matthew 1. Just go back a little earlier in the chapter. We're going to be looking specifically at verses 3, 5, and 6. What you're going to see in chapter 1 is Matthew gives Jesus' genealogy on his dad's side. So it's like, the father of, the father of, the father of, the father, the father of, the father of, the father of, the father of, the father of. He starts all the way down, right? But every once in a while, he doesn't just mention the father. He mentions who they're married to or who the mother is, right? So take a look at verses 3, 5, and, and 6 with me. He goes, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. And then he says, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And Jesse, the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah, Uriah's wife. So it's four times in the genealogy he mentions these women. Now, I know because I checked. Uh, I know we have several campuses this weekend who have kids in the room with them right now. So I'm aware of that, Okay. So I'm going to say what I'm about to say as generally and as safely as I possibly can. Uh, Tamar and Judah had Perez and Zerah together, and Tamar was their mom. Tamar is actually Judah's 
widowed daughter-in-law. Um, and Tamar disguised herself as a lady of the night to force Judah to preserve her family line. That's the story. Uh, Rahab, Rahab was a madam. Um, and Rahab uh, hid uh, Israelite spies so that the Israelites army could come in and sack her city. Um, Ruth was a Moabite foreigner who stayed with her mother-in-law as they went back to where Naomi was from, this little town of Bethlehem, which is why Mary and Joseph are in this boat in the first place generations later. And Uriah's wife is a woman named Bathsheba. Um, Bathsheba um, <clears throat> was someone that King David had a secret affair with and tried to cover up a conspiracy to kill her husband. Um, and uh, they have a kid together, but they lost their first child together. And so Solomon is their second. So that's Jesus's family tree. Not easy. Not easy. And of course, we get more tough family stuff in the early days, in the early years of Jesus's family in the Christmas story and beyond. Uh, Mary and Joseph have to go back to their ancestral home to register for a, cen a census in Bethlehem. None of their family either lives there anymore, or maybe their family does live there anymore, but they don't want anything to do with the unmarried pregnant couple. So they don't have any place to stay, and they have the Son of God in a feeding trough. Uh, not easy. A Herod, the king in that region, learns of his birth, Jesus' birth, and he learns of this divine prophetic story surrounding Jesus' birth, and he, he feels threatened by it, and he goes on this murderous rampage. And Mary and Joseph have to flee to Egypt, but every other family in Bethlehem with toddler boys is forever impacted. I mean, Mary and Joseph are a pariah. Not easy. And even when Jesus grows up, okay, his family is still not easy. This is from Mark 3. It says, Then Jesus entered a house. This is adult Jesus, okay? And a crowd gathered around him because he was doing amazing stuff and saying amazing stuff so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Super popular. And when his family heard about this, they cheered him on. <laughs> nope. They went to take charge of him for they said he is out of his mind. Family Jesus's family, not easy. Family more often than not, my friends, right? Not, it's just not easy. It just isn't. Family's not easy. I mean, these beautiful, these, these peaceful, these dark, you know, navy night sky Christmas scenes with, with the bright shining star above and this like, perfectly symmetrical, um, stable, you know, these, these, um, these Instagram worthy Christmas table place settings, you know, with these bright shining faces around each chair. I mean, don't get me wrong. Okay. I love, I love those. And, and honestly, the holidays can, can bring some of those moments, right? They really can. But boy, we sure chase after them. Even so, family more often than not does not look like that. <laughs> Jesus' family didn't. His family just, just isn't easy. Lord knows. Literally the Lord knows, right? Jesus knows. It, it wasn't for him either. It wasn't for him either. So, so, so listen. Um, them is not easy, so let's stop chasing easy. Let's stop chasing easy when it comes to our family. I, I, I get it. We, we all wish it was easier. You know, we all do. If your dad would just, um, if, if your daughter wouldn't, <laughs> or if they married that, I'm sure they're going to bring up that one time that, you know, I'm sure they are. And, and you're right. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier if. But 
and I know you already know this. <laughs> your dad won't. Uh, your daughter will. Uh, they did marry you know who, and they are going to bring that thing up, right? I mean, that's all going to happen. It really will. And so we can, we can choose to chase easy and then just get disappointed when it's not. Or here's what we can do. We can start chasing Jesus, especially in the tough stuff of family especially in it. And we've, we've read the story from Matthew 1 of how you know, Jesus' family line was and how he was conceived and just all the tough stuff in that. Um, we read about how the angel explained what was really going on. But after all this happens, okay, the author of Matthew goes on to say this in Matthew 1. Here's what he says. He goes, all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means life is easy. (laughs) No, which means God with us. God with us. Jesus... Jesus didn't come to make it easier. He came to be with us and and with us, especially in the tough stuff, you know, with us, with us in the, in the tough stuff and the, and the real stuff and the complex stuff and the, and the messy stuff of our families, the, the broken stuff, the stuck stuff, the, the never going to change stuff of our families. He came to be with us in the resentful stuff, in the dark stuff. And the stuff nobody wants to talk about. Jesus came to be with us in the, uh, in the ship has sailed stuff. The can't take it back stuff of our families. With us in that stuff. God in the flesh, like really with us in the real stuff of our real families okay so so listen here's what we're going to do and we're just something a little bit different this weekend but here's what we're going to do we're doing it all across our campuses we're going to create some some real space for you right now to kind of interact with this and we and, and we're going to ask you um, to do some reflection uh, on 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 how jesus might need to be with you in some of the stuff of our family and how, how Jesus might, might want to and need to meet you in between what you just wish were true about your family and what actually is true about your family. How does he need to meet you? Um, so we're going to create some space for you to do that. In fact, we're going to give you a tool um, to help you do it. And your weekend host is, is going to lead you through that here in just a second. But let me just encourage you, okay? Take advantage of this. Test it out with him to see if it's true. Don't, don't just check out. Okay, let me, let me just pray over this moment and then your weekend also take it from here. Just, let me just pray. Father in heaven, uh, we're grateful that you came to earth <laughs> to be with us, to be with us, to be with us, to be with us in the tough stuff, even tough stuff for our families. Uh, God, would you meet us right where we're at right now and help us see how your son Jesus might need to meet us between the gap of what we wish for and what actually is. And do it in a way, God, that brings life and hope and encouragement to our hearts. Change it from the inside out as we head into this holiday season with our families. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Come, all ye faithful Joyful and triumphant, O come, ye, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and be born in, born the King of angels.
sing choirs of angels sing in exaltation sing all ye citizens of heaven above glory to God all glory in the highest oh come let us adore him no come let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord true God of true God light from light eternal Lord he shuns not the Son of the Father, begotten, not created. Child for us sinners, poor and in the manger we would embrace thee with love and awe who would not love thee loving thy so dearly oh come Happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, oh, come Christ the Lord. I hope you had some good time to reflect during that last song. Um, and as Pastor Jesse encouraged us, encourage you to continue reflecting, create some space at home. Uh, if you're in a spot that you can do that. Or, um, as always, if you need prayer or you want to talk to someone, uh, we have people ready right now to do just that. Uh, so if you're in church online, you can hit the live prayer button. If you're on our social media, you can send us a message and we would love to be there for you. Uh, but kids, uh, don't run off just yet. Children's ministry is about ready to begin. Everyone else, I look forward to seeing you back for week two of our Advent series.
chosen by you forever i'm your friend you'll always be right here with me i'm so thankful for your love no matter what i do i know this is true you're by my side you'll spelling is that? Oh, hey, welcome to Story Lab. This week we're talking about gratitude while we take a look at a super helpful habit. <laughs> Shout out to whoever invented the eraser. Hey, I'm Carter. And I'm Zeke. We're talking about gratitude. Which is letting others know you see how they've helped you. Who's the car for? My big sister. She's basically the best sister in the world. You got any scientific evidence for that? Well, she helped me learn to ride a bike. Plus, she always checked my closet for monsters. I like to eat socks. And when I couldn't understand fractions, she made it all easy. This is one sixth of a pizza. See? Best sister in the world. Okay, that's pretty convincing evidence. Are you doing anything for her birthday? Now, see, that's the problem. What's the problem? Well, she loves cinnamon rolls, so every year for her birthday breakfast, I get her these awesome, gooey cinnamon rolls. No problem there. But this year she went gluten-free, and I can't find any gluten-free cinnamon rolls anywhere. Well, why don't you make them? Because I'm not a pastry chef. I know how you can learn in five minutes. Five minutes? For reals? For reals. Then, let's make it! Okay, where do we start? One tablespoon of oil. What are we mixing it in? This. Cinnamon rolls in a mug? Gluten-free cinnamon roll microwavable mug cake, to be exact. Genius. There we go. Okay, what next? Two tablespoons of sugar. Add one egg yolk. Wait, how do you put in just the egg yolk? Like this. Use your hand like a sieve. So as you can see, the egg yolk is splitting from the egg white. And then when you have nothing but the yolk, put it in the mug. Looks delicious. Now, you mix that up with a fork while I go wash my hands. Please. All right, great. Then we add two tablespoons of milk. Like that and then a one-fourth cup of all-purpose gluten-free flour. Zeke, would you be so kind? Of course. 
You can also just use regular flour if you don't need it to be gluten free. Then a 1 8 teaspoon baking powder. And half a teaspoon of cinnamon. Now mix it all up. Uh, uh, gently. Wow, that's it? Well, we still gotta make some ooey gooey frosting. But right now, it's time for... The story before the story. Today, we're in the book of Exodus and the book of 1 Corinthians. In the beginning, God created an amazing world, but people forgot God and turned away. The world was broken. God chose one family, the Israelites, and promised to bless the entire world through them. But God's people were enslaved in the land of Egypt for hundreds of years. The people cried out to God and God saved them. But it's so easy to forget the amazing things God has done. So God told the people to hold a celebration. Each year they would eat a special meal to help them remember how God saved them. And though the Israelites did forget again and again, they still came back to that special meal. Which is where our story starts. Take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Brian. More than a thousand years after God led the people out of Egypt, Jewish people were still celebrating that special meal, the Passover. In fact, the night before Jesus gave up his life, he ate the Passover meal with his closest friends. Take this and eat it. Now each time the Jewish people ate the Passover meal, it reminded them of how hard they had been forced to work in Egypt. Then God sent Moses to face down Pharaoh and demand freedom for the Israelites. Let my people go. Over and over, Pharaoh promised to let the Israelites go, but then changed his mind. And each time, God sent a plague, a, a terrible warning, so Pharaoh would release the Israelites. There were frogs, flies, hail, darkness, and more. Finally, God sent the tenth and most terrible plague of all. The Lord says, Every oldest son in Egypt will die. It was a terrible day, but God made a way to save the sons of the Israelites. Go at once. Each family must kill a Passover lamb. Put some of the blood on top and on both sides of the door frame. The Lord won't let the destroying angel enter your homes. The Israelites did just as God had told them. After a heartbreaking night, the Israelites were saved. At last, Pharaoh ordered them to leave. Get out of here. Go! The Israelites packed up so quickly they didn't even have time for their bread to rise, so they baked flat bread without yeast. Mmm, crunchy. Then, God led them out of Egypt to freedom. God told the people, Always remember this day. You and your children after you must celebrate this day as a feast to honor the Lord. So as God instructed, the Israelites made a habit of celebrating Passover with a meal that included lamb and flatbread with no yeast, like the bread they'd taken on their journey out of Egypt. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. Jesus himself grew up celebrating the Passover every single year. But when he shared the Passover with his friends the night before he died, Jesus did something different. He gave a brand new meaning to the Passover meal. The Apostle Paul wrote about that evening years later in his letter to the Corinthians. On the night the Lord Jesus was handed over to his enemies, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It is given for you. Every time you eat it, do it in memory of me. The bread was a reminder of how the very next day, Jesus would give himself up and allow himself to be killed for us. Paul continued, In the same way, after supper he took the cup. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do it in memory of me. The drink was a reminder of how Jesus would allow his own blood to be spilled so that we can live. And because of Jesus, we don't have to try to prove to God that we're good enough. All we have to do is believe that Jesus came to rescue us and choose to follow him. Jesus took that old habit of gratitude, the Passover, and turned it into a brand new habit of gratitude, the Lord's Supper or Communion. 
The Passover meal was a celebration of how God had rescued the Israelites from slavery. Now, the Lord's Supper is a celebration of how God has made it possible for everyone to be rescued from sin and death through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And for the last 2,000 years, people have been celebrating what Jesus did for us by eating bread and drinking wine or juice together. Some churches do it every Sunday or every month. Others might do it a few times a year. They use different kinds of bread or wafers or wine or juice. But in every case, the habit is the same. It's a beautiful chance to remember together the amazing way that God has rescued us and how God has given us so much. We can always be thankful. The end. You know, it's super easy to think all these Bible stories are kind of random, but no way. It's all connected in such an incredible way. First, God made a plan to save one family, the Israelites. And from that family, God made a plan to save everyone who follows Jesus. Yeah, and God gave us a special way to remember. So what's our part in the story? Well, just like the Israelites, we can form habits of gratitude. One of the easiest ways to start is with mealtime. Yeah, when we thank God for our food. Now, your family might already have that habit. If not, you could start it. And you can always take a few moments and thank God for your food, even if you're eating on your own or at school. It doesn't even have to be out loud. You can connect habits of gratitude to other parts of the day too. Like when you wake up, you can thank God for a brand new day even if you're not a morning person. <laughs> you could also make a habit of thanking your teacher anytime they help you at school. Or your parents when they help you at home. And at night, before you go to bed, take time to think back through your day. You can choose one specific thing to thank God for, like how good it felt to hit that ball super hard, or if your mom made your favorite dinner. Or just the amazing fact that your heart is beating and your lungs are taking in air, all because God makes it happen. So, we can make a habit of thanking God in the morning, at mealtime, at school, and at bedtime. Yeah, and the awesome thing about habits is that they actually blah, 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 rewire your brain. So if you start with one time and focus on being thankful every day, in about eh, three weeks, your brain will remind you automatically. I'm thankful God made our brain so awesome. <laughs> you got it. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. See you next time. So, here's the thing. Make a habit of being grateful. I am grateful in advance for this delectable mug cake. Can we zap it yet? Sure thing. Ooh, zap. Frosting, please. Yeah, right in there. That's perfect. Right there? Okay. It's glorious. Thanks for joining us in the story lab. See you next time. Mm, yum. This is so delicious. I'm definitely making the habit of this for my sister's birthday. Oh yeah, she's gonna love this. Mm-hmm.